You mentioned planaria being in some sense immortal. Uh, what's the role of death in life? What's the role of death in this whole process we have? Is, is it, uh, when you look at biological systems, is death an important feature? Especially as you climb up the hierarchy of uh, competency? Boy, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that uh, it's certainly a factor that promotes change and turnover and uh, an opportunity to do something different the next time um, for a larger scale system. So apoptosis, you know, it's re it's really interesting. I mean, de death is really interesting in a number of ways. One is like you could think about like what was the first thing to die? You know, that's that's an interesting question. What was the first creature that you could say actually die? It's a tough it's a tough thing because we don't have a great definition for it. So if you bring a a cabbage home and you put it in your fridge, at what point are you going to say it's died? Right then, so so that's it's kind of hard um, to know. There's also there's also uh, th th there's 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 one paper in which I talk about this idea that I mean think about think about this and and, and imagine that uh, you have you have a creature uh, that's aquatic. Let's say let's say it's a it's a frog or something or or a tadpole. And the animal dies in the in the pond. It dies for whatever reason. M most of the cells are still alive. So you could imagine that if, when it died, there was some sort of um, breakdown of of of, uh, of the of the connectivity between the cells, and a bunch of cells crawled off. They could have a life as amoebas. They some of them could join together and become a xenobot and tootle around, right? So we know from Planaria that there are cells that don't obey the Hayflick limit and just sort of live live forever. So you could imagine an organism that when the organism dies, it doesn't disappear. Rather, the individual cells that are still alive crawl off and have a completely different kind of lifestyle and maybe come back together as something else, or maybe they don't. So so all of this I'm sure is happening somewhere on some on some on some planet. So so um, death, in any case, I mean, we already kind of knew this because the molecules, we, you know, we know that when something dies, the molecules go through the ecosystem. But even the cells don't necessarily die at that point. They might have another life in a, in a, different, uh, in a different way. And you can think about something like HeLa, right? The HeLa cell line, you know, that has this, that's had this incredible life. Uh, there are way more HeLa cells now than there ever been, than there, than there were when, when she was alive. It seems like as the organisms become more and more complex, like if you look at the mammals, their relationship with death becomes more and more complex. So the survival imperative starts becoming interesting. And humans are arguably the first species that have invented the fear of death the understanding that you're going to die, let's put it this way. Like a long, so not like inst instinctual, like yeah, yeah. I need to run away from the thing that's gonna eat me, but starting to contemplate the finiteness of life. Yeah. I mean, one thing, so so one thing about the human um, light, cognitive light cone is that for the first, as far as we know, for the first time, you might have goals that are longer than your life that are not achievable, right? Yeah. So if you're if you are let's say, and I, I don't know if this is true, but if if you're a goldfish and you have a ten minute attention span, I'm not sure if that's true, but let's say let's say there's some organism with a sh with a short um, you know kind of cognitive light cone that way, all of your goals are potentially achievable because you're probably going to live the next ten minutes. So whatever goals you have, they are totally achievable. If you're a human you could have all kinds of goals that are guaranteed not achievable because they just take too long, like guaranteed you're not going to achieve them. Yeah. So I wonder if, you know, is that, is that a per, uh, you know, like a perennial, um, you know, sort of thorn in our, in our psychology that drives some, some psychoses or whatever. I have, I have no idea. Another interesting thing about that, actually, and I've, I've been thinking about this a lot in the last couple of weeks, this notion of giving up. So you would think that evolutionarily the most, um, adaptive way of being is that you go, you, 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 you fight as long as you physically can. And then when you can't, you can't. And there's in, there's this photograph, there's um, videos you can find of insects uh, crawling around where like, you know, this, like, like most of it is already gone and it's still sort of crawling, you know, like, like um, um, uh, Terminator style, right? Like as far as, as long as you physically can, you keep going. Mammals don't do that. So, so a lot of mammals, including rats have this thing where when, when they think it's, it's a hopeless situation, they literally give up and die when physically they could have kept going. I mean, humans certainly do this. And there's there's some like really unpleasant experiments that the, the this guy, I forget his name, did with um, drowning rats, where if he where where rats normally drown after a couple of minutes, but if you teach them that if you just tread water for a couple of minutes, you'll get rescued, they can tread water for like an hour. 
And so, right. And so they literally just give up and die. And so evolutionarily, that doesn't seem like a good strategy at all. Evolutionarily, since why would you like, what's the benefit ever of giving up? You just do what you can. And, you know, one time out of a thousand, you'll actually get rescued, right? But this issue of, 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 of actually giving up suggests some very interesting metacognitive controls where you've now gotten to the point where survival actually isn't the top drive. And that for whatever, you know, there are other considerations that have like taken over. And I, I think that's uniquely a mammalian thing, but um, I, I don't know. Yeah, the Camus, the existentialist question of why live, yeah. just the fact that humans commit suicide. Mm -hmm. Is a really fascinating question from an evolutionary yep. perspective. And what was the first? And that's the other thing. Like, wh wh what is the simplest uh, system, whether whether evolved or you know, natural or whatever, that is able to do that? Right. Like, you can think. You know, what other animals are actually able to do that? I'm not sure. Maybe you could see animals over time, for some reason, lowering the value of survive at all costs gradually until other objectives might become more important. Maybe, I don't know how evolutionarily how that how that gets off the ground. That just seems like that would have such a strong pressure against it, you know. Just imagine a you know a, a population with 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 a lower um, you know, with with if if you were a mutant in a population that had less of a uh, uh, less of a survival imperative, would you would your genes outperform the others? It is seems it, not. Is there such a thing as population selection because maybe suicide is a way uh, for organisms to decide that themselves that they're not fit for the environment somehow. Yeah, that's a, that's a really uh, contrary. You know, population level selection is a, is a kind of a deep controversial area, but it's tough because on the face of it, if that was your genome, it wouldn't get propagated because you yeah. would die, and then your neighbor who didn't have that would would have all the kids. It feels like there could be some deep truth there that we're not maybe. understanding. Yeah, maybe. Um, what about you yourself as one biological system? Are you afraid of death? To be honest, I'm more concerned with, uh, especially now getting older and having helped a couple of people pass, I think about what's a, um, what's a good way to go, basically. Like nowadays, I don't know what that is. I, you know, sitting in a, you know, a, a facility that sort of tries to, uh, stretch you out as, as, as long as you can, that doesn't seem, that doesn't seem good. And, and there's not a lot of opportunities to sort of, um, I don't know, sacrifice yourself for something useful, right? There's not terribly many opportunities for that in modern society. So I don't know. I, that's, that's, that's more of, I'm not, I'm not particularly worried about, uh, death itself, but, uh, I've, I've seen it happen, uh, and, and, uh, it's not, it's not pretty. And I don't know what what a better what a better alternative is. So the existential aspect of it does not worry you deeply. The fact that this ride no. ends. No, it began. I mean, the ride began, right? So there was I don't know how many b billions of years before that I wasn't around. So that's okay. But isn't the experience of life? It's almost like feels like you're immortal. Because the, the way you make plans, the way you think about yeah. the future, I mean, if if you re, if you look at your own personal rich experience, yes, you can understand. Okay, eventually I die. There's people I love that have died, so surely I will die, and it hurts, and so on. But like, sure, it doesn't. It's so easy to get lost in, in feeling like this is going to go on forever. Yeah. It's a little bit like the people who say they don't believe in free will, right? I mean, you can say that, but but when you go to a restaurant, you still have to pick a soup and stuff. So, right? So, so I don't know if I know. I've I've actually seen that uh, that happen at lunch with a with a well known uh, philosopher, and uh, he didn't believe in free will. And you know, the waitress came around, and he was like, "Well, let me see." I was like, "What are you doing? You're you're going to choose a, a sandwich, yeah. right?" So, um, it's I think it's one of those things. I think you you can know that you know you're not going to live forever, but you can't, you can't, it's not practical to live that way unless, you know, so you buy insurance and then you do some stuff like that. But, but, but mostly, you know, um, I think you just, you just live as if, uh, as if, as if you can make plans.